¿Qué tal, tribu? ¡Feliz 2019! Y bienvenidas a Marihuana Now, el programa para las personas que les gusta la hierba. ¿Sabíais que Estados Unidos es el país que más drogas consume del mundo? El país de la libertad tiene el 5% de la población mundial y el 25% de la población penitenciaria mundial, es decir, de personas presas. Y la gran mayoría, entre un 80 y 90%, son personas negras y latinas. En el capítulo de hoy os presentamos una parte inédita de la entrevista que le hice en California a la abogada y activista Kendra Miller, de Cannabis Business Law y Norm Women's Alliance. Hablaremos de personas negras, latinas y mujeres en el mundo de la cannabis. Con la legalización actual hay mejoras, pero las desigualdades y las disparidades raciales continúan. Atentas. The reason why I became an activist was to stop the criminal liability. That's the real positive for me that I hold on to because I do not believe that anyone should go to jail or be separated from their families because of their relationship to this plant. Under prohibition, and a lot of the arguments that were used to end prohibition had to do with the unfair impact that the war on drugs had on communities of color. African American, Latino, primarily. Um, and the statistics are alarming. You know, the arrest rates for people of color are much higher, even though the consumption and usage rates among various cultural uh, groups uh, is, you know, about the same. So I am hoping that with legalization we'll see a shift. I am hopeful. And I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, my concern, though, is that I'm not seeing the numbers of people of color coming into the legal industry, at least in California thus far. And I think that's why you see, not only for people of color, but people who may be um, economically disadvantaged, living in low-income neighborhoods who were targeted more um, under the war on drugs. <laughs> Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, having the, the three largest counties having an equity program to try and deal with the disparity or the difference between those who were impacted by the war on drugs and then allowing them a bridge to entry into legalization. And I'm just not seeing the, the participation on the legal side as much yet. Maybe that's just me not seeing it, but um, I would like to see more participation. Al principio cuando fumaba, poquito fumamos aquí para pensar que estamos en la ciudad más cara de Estados Unidos. <laughs> estamos fumando mota. <laughs> Our goal was to educate women and get women to understand why we needed to end prohibition. Even if you don't consume, it's the protection of your families. You know, if your child, even if you don't consume it, if your child consumed and got caught, it could be, um, you know, you're leading, talking about felony arrests, you're talking about maybe losing your college loan tuition, maybe losing an opportunity to go to college just because you're in possession of this plant. The many ways that it can impact the family and start to educate women on that was why I got involved. And organizing women has been one of the most empowering and uplifting parts of this whole journey for me. Now, there is the statistics going around about the cannabis industry has more women participating in the executive levels than in than other industries. That is true about women dominating at the executive levels, but primarily just in California, okay? So not nationwide, but just in California. And then uh, since the passage of Prop 64, that number has stabilized and started to go down. So that concerns me as well, you know. Uh, I like to jokingly say, you know, it's the female part of the plant that is giving us all of the healing energy. It would only make sense that women would dominate in this industry. Um, so uh, once again, everything is new. You know, we've got a new State Department, we've got new regulations. There's a lot more that remains to be seen and a lot of adjustment that's gonna have to be made in order to make the industry thrive in the state of California.
sexual harassment, you know, that still exists. You know, there are those issues. There's issues uh, in family law, uh, which was a surprise. I wasn't expecting that when I first became an activist, but let's say spouses, they have children and then they separate. And so one spouse may use the cannabis consumption of another spouse as a reason to get custody of the child, you know? Sexual harassment being probably the most prevalent one that I've, I hear from women, whether or not they're women of color, but from women in general. So there's still a lot of work to be done, as you can see in politics and entertainment and music and every other industry, right? Cannabis is no different. We're not done, you know? Like we passed 64, but that's just the beginning. Um, and I think that's the, the number one message that I, I have to repeat. It's like, we're, we're not done, we've just begun. And right now, if you've got economic disadvantage, racial polarization, workplace you know, disadvantage or polarization, then those women need to have a safe place where they can come and express those grievances, have their voices be heard, so that then we can take it as the future lobbying powerhouse in the industry through Normal Women's Alliance and make change and make sure that those issues that, that women who are afraid to speak are represented. Because that's where we're not going to make change until we can have representation in government of those, those concerns from those voices. From Palestine to Mexico, these border walls have got to go! Always. It's important to educate from a feminist perspective. Always. <laughs> no matter what we're talking about. Why? Because that's the balance. We want the balance of the male-female perspective in everything that we do. We need diverse voices. There's still a lack, at least it's on, even on the lecture circuit for you know cannabis people in the know. You know, I'm still annoyed when I look at panels and I don't see women of color. No os perdáis la entrevista completa a Kendra que publicaremos muy pronto en nuestro canal de YouTube de Marihuana Televisión. Atentas porque en Barcelona, en el CCCB, en frente de la Facultad de Geografía e Historia de la UB, tendrá lugar la presentación de campaña Consumo con Derechos. Somos muchas las personas que consumimos cannabis de manera consciente y responsable. Países como Uruguay, Canadá o Alemania están avanzando los modelos de regulación. En España, no. La situación actual, además de crear inseguridad jurídica en los consumidores, los criminaliza. De hecho, a mí me quieren meter en prisión por ser secretario de una asociación canábica. Yo cultivo hace más de 20 años y para mí nada más rico que lo que sale de mi jardín. Pero claro, para producir eso en tu jardín tendrás que tener una ley que te proteja. A mí también me han multado por llevar cannabis en el bolso. De hecho, el 50% de las sanciones interpuestas en base a la mordaza son por posesión de cannabis. Exijo, reclamo a todos, políticos, juristas, legalistas, jueces, médicos, farmacéuticos, que de una vez se pongan en la situación de tantos miles de personas como yo que sufren dolores y arreglen esta situación de una vez. Urge una regulación responsable que otorgue derechos al consumo y garantice un uso responsable del cannabis. Seguimos en lucha. ¿Te sumas? Este fin de semana, San Canuto, en Barcelona, Madrid, Alicante, Zaragoza, Santiago de Compostela, Menorca y Marihuana Televisión estarán en Fuerteventura, otro año en el que nos invitan nuestros amigos canarios y no nos lo perdemos. La nueva sección de mi compañero Miguel Jimeno es La Pera. La podéis ver en el último Marihuana News 79, con toda la actualidad, nuestra visita a la ONU y la cannabis en los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. Y muy pronto el News 80, enero 2019, con nuevos contenidos y, como siempre, los mejores consejos para tu autocultivo. ¡Feliz año! ¡Mucho amor y muchas flores! Ella también es una activista canábica, la estoy convirtiendo en activista canábica. ¿Verdad, amor? <risa> <risa>